Did you hear that somebody blew up the Georgia Guidestones? The internet says it's true. Hey. Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where every week we learn something that sounds made up, but it's really true. Part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent. Welcome back. Let's learn something new. Now, this week I started working on another episode, a story about Orson Welles and media hysteria. But halfway through the week, something crazy happened. So let me go back a minute and explain. I have a running list of topics that I want to cover for the show. And when someone sends me one or I find one on my own, I add it to that list. And one of the things that has been on there for a long time is the Georgia Guidestones. Explaining what they are and how they got where they are and what they mean and all that. So I was already going to cover this topic. Then on Wednesday of this week, two weeks ago for those listening who are not on Patreon... Someone blew up the Guidestones, so it's time to cover this topic. I switched horses midstream, so this week we're going to talk about this crazy redneck Stonehenge. Also, super excited for this, later in the show, we're going to be joined by professional mind reader Jonathan Pritchard. I love talking with Jonathan, so stay tuned for that. So this week's topic comes to us from, well, from the news. And uh, it's all about the Georgia Guidestones. In the state of Georgia, Governor Brian Kemp will be running to keep his seat this year. But there were a whole host of extreme right-wing candidates running against him. Some of them were very extreme. This is a political ad from one of those candidates, Candace Taylor. Over 4 billion people have been injected with something that took just nine months to create. Ask yourself why. Back in biblical times, human sacrifice was a form of demonic worship. We're still doing it in present day by killing our unborn. It's the same demons, it's the same sacrifice, it's the same sin, it's just a different time. If we don't call things out and we don't acknowledge them and we don't take authority and take dominion over what God's given us, then we are no better than the evil ones that put it up. We've watched as people have destroyed our history and monuments, and in their place, they have erected statues to their own gods. The new world order is here, and they told us it was coming. It's a battle far greater than what we see in the natural. It is a war between good and evil. Now, at the end of this ad, text appears on the screen saying, quote, Executive Order Number 10, Destroy the Georgia Guidestones. Yes, this woman is unhinged. Let's go back to 43 years ago. In 1979, a man named Robert C. Christian went to the Elberton Granite Finishing Company and asked about the construction of a monument. Robert C. Christian wasn't his real name. No one has ever come forward with his real identity, and only one man supposedly knows it, the banker who this mystery man met with to hold the money for the job and to help guide its construction after he left. That man is still alive, but won't reveal the name. Robert C. Christian did reveal that his group lived outside of Georgia. Online sleuths have traced the true identity of Robert C. Christian to a man from Fort Dodge, Iowa, Herbert Kirsten. Now, Joe Fendley, the president of the Granite Company, said the man was neatly dressed and wanted to erect the statue on behalf of a, quote, small group of loyal Americans who believe in God. He explained that it was meant to be a monument to the conservation of mankind. He presented a model of what he wanted it to look like, along with 10 pages of instructions, something based off of Stonehenge, but Unlike Stonehenge, he said, this would have a message. They had been planning it for 20 years. He wanted it to be a series of upright large stones, and it was a project so large the granite had to come from a quarry outside the county. Fenley, the monument company man, quoted a huge price. Now, he's never said exactly how much, but he said it was more than $100,000. He saw the man as a religious nut, and he didn't want to do the work. The quote was several times more than anything the company had ever charged for a monument, and Fenley was surprised when the man agreed to pay the price no questions asked, so they agreed. This mystery man, Robert C. Christian, 
purchased a five-acre plot of land at the highest part of Elbert County, Georgia, for the location of this monument. It was on the farm of Wayne and Mildred Mullinex. Judging by the price he paid the monument company, he likely compensated the couple well for a piece of land on their farm. The statue was unveiled on March 22, 1980. We must stress today the need for self-control, for self-restraint, and yes, self-government, all of which I interpret in this Georgia Guidestone. Here's what the final product looked like. Six tall granite slabs of stone, each one 19 feet 3 inches tall and weighing a total of more than 237,000 pounds. On the stones were inscriptions in eight different languages, English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, traditional Chinese, and Russian. The text inscribed was meant to be a guide for humans to continue rebuilding and restructuring society after a nuclear war. Apparently, this man had expressed that he saw on the horizon an upcoming social, economic, and nuclear calamity. The inscriptions listed out ten steps. They are as follows. 1. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. 2. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. 3. Unite humanity with a living new language. 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and and all things with tempered reason. 5. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. 6. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. 7. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. 8. Balance personal rights with social duties. 9. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. And 10. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Now, if you're not really listening that closely, you might hear some of those and think, that doesn't sound all that bad. Don't be a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Those are great things to put on a monument. But let's revisit those first couple. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. That, my friends, is what's known as eugenics. It's a horrible science to build a population of people based on the ideals of whatever group is currently in power. It's most commonly associated with the Nazi party, but has had supporters in many nations and many times and is antithetical to the concept of human rights for all. So in that way, the Guidestones were horrible, but not satanic, as claimed by some people, including the politician whose ad I played at the top of the episode. If Herbert Kirsten was indeed the actual identity of Robert C. Christian, and the evidence looks pretty solid, he was a Christian medical doctor and was well known for promoting conservation efforts, birth control, and abortion. He wasn't any sort of Satanist Illuminati. A few yards west from the stones, there's a large flat stone level with the ground that acts as a sort of guidestone to the guidestones. It has a statement, Let these be guidestones to reason and it translates that into Babylonian cuneiform, classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now, there have always been rumors of a buried time capsule six feet below this marker stone. The way the guide stones were constructed also acts as an astronomical calendar. The four outer stones were oriented to mark the limits of the lunar declination cycle. The center stone featured a hole drilled at an angle that's just right so you could look through it to see the North Star one night, and it had a slot carved through it which was aligned with the sun's solstices and equinoxes. The Georgia Guidestones became a tourist attraction and local oddity in 1980, and remained relatively unharmed other than a few graffiti incidents here and there. But the week I'm recording this, on July 6th, the life of the monument came to a suspicious end. We'll talk about it after a quick break. I have a special announcement for all my female listeners. Are you a woman podcaster looking to take your show to the next level? If the answer is yes, then you need to come to She Podcasts Live this October. You'll be able to learn from some of the best female podcasters in the world and get insider tips on how to make your podcast even better. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, this event is for you. Not only will you be able to learn tons of new information, but you'll also be able to network with other amazing podcasters. This is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to take their podcasting skills to the next level. 
Additionally, She Podcasts Live is committed to bringing a diverse and inclusive lineup, and their team works very hard to make sure those chosen are 50% women of color, LGBTQIA+, or both. They also highlight industry experts and leaders in the space, so attendees are exposed to the women at the top. Register now. You don't want to miss this event in D.C. Go to ShePodcastsLive.com and enter promo code TIZIT, T-I-S-I-T, to get $50 off your registration. Two movie critics, two big egos, make for one fun, enlightening podcast about movies and movie makers. Join John DeSando and Johnny DiLoretto as they embark on a new cinematic adventure, Double Take, a show exploring where great films converge with and diverge from other great and not-so-great films. Whether you're a casual moviegoer or a serious cinephile, you'll find at least one, maybe even two, insights worth your time. Double Take, critical, sometimes confrontational, always amusing conversations about movies. Find it on WCBE.org podcast experience. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing balms, but unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seem to stop around the same time that animal fats stop being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. Let's get back to the story. On Wednesday, July 6th of 2022, residents of Elberton, Georgia, woke up to see the Guidestones had been partially destroyed. It's happening right now in eastern Georgia. Investigators are working to learn what and who damaged the Georgia Guidestones. So far, we know part of the 42-year-old monument was damaged by some kind of explosive. It's all happening in Elbert County. That's near the South Carolina border. Tonight, we have our first look at the explosion at the Georgia Guidestones. The GBI just releasing this video hours ago, and you can see there is a bright flash and then part of the structure. A Georgia monument that some refer to as America's Stonehenge was destroyed yesterday in a pre-dawn bombing. A surveillance camera captured the explosion. Look at this early yesterday morning. And moments later, a car can be seen leaving the scene. Police are still searching for the person responsible for the blast. The granite guidestones sit near the town of El. We can probably assume that the many conspiracy theorists who claim that the stones were a satanic temple were excited to hear the news. Candace Taylor, the politician who made destroying the Guidestones part of her political plan in her run for governor, had to be thrilled. By the way, she had the full support of Mike Lindell, the My Pillow guy. Just wanted to let you know that. She once said on social media, quote, I am the only candidate bold enough to stand up to the Luciferian cabal. Also, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman from Georgia's 14th district, once described the Guidestones on Facebook as revealing a world genocide plot. But this is the lady that said that California wildfires were caused by Jewish space lasers, so I guess we're lucky she didn't get all anti-Semitic with the Guidestones theory. And as far as the world genocide thing, I guess I kind of see where she's coming from. It's right there on the first of the 10 ordered instructions for rebuilding humanity. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Now, there are 7.7 billion people in the world, so I get it. But what Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't understand, apparently, is that humanity doesn't create worldwide laws according to a weird roadside attraction in Georgia. Somebody blew up the stones, and we can probably assume that the demise of the guide stones likely had something to do with the many rumors and conspiracy theories surrounding them. The attraction had a security camera that caught the explosion. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation released the video to the public, and you can see someone in dark clothes sprinting into the frame, leaving the explosive device and then sprinting away before the explosion knocks down one of the large, upright slabs and part of the top stone. Several hours later, authorities knocked down the remaining stones for safety. The entire monument was gone. Part of the construction that was done on the site to clean it up was to dig under the marker stone for the time capsule. Nothing was found. At the point of this recording, we still don't know who blew up the Georgia Guidestones. 
If it ends up being some Christian conservative blowing them up because they were thought to be satanic, I'd be foolish not to point out the hypocrisy of complaining about a monument having it removed. You know, where are all the, they're destroying our history people, right? Maybe it was just a bunch of kids with a gun and some Tannerite explosives. Or maybe it had something to do with a politician who promised to make it a central tenet of their campaign to destroy the stones. Who knows? Wendy Rogers in Arizona, that's right, this is a nationwide issue, people, not just a Georgia issue. Wendy Rogers said, quote, The Georgia Guidestones are evil and satanic. I'm glad to see the authorities tearing it down. We only support and worship the one true God, not an imposter and the father of all lies, end quote. By the way, Candace Taylor put out a very defensive video statement about the destruction, giving credit to God. Because one of the initial theories before the video emerged was that the stones were destroyed by lightning. Here's that video. I believe vandalism is illegal. And sometimes people like to call vandalism instead of actually giving God credit because they don't know how to explain what happens when God moves. So until I see a video that shows me anything but what looked like lightning or the hand of God moving on a situation, I'm going to believe that it was God. If it was vandalism, then there's cameras everywhere, all over the place, that would have picked that up and those people should be brought to justice. Do not put words in my mouth. I am keeping record, video footage, screenshots and every single thing that's being said that's a lie i'm keeping it i believe in law and order in this country i have another theory i don't think it was lightning lightning and i don't think it was conspiracy theorists i think it was aliens yes aliens and i have some proof to back that up candace taylor tweeted these words on wednesday we are being invaded Well, now it's time for the part of the podcast where I call a buddy. Today, we're calling Jonathan Pritchard, and Jonathan is a speaker, author, he's a consultant, and he's a mind reader. He wrote the books, Think Like a Mind Reader, Learn Like a Mind Reader, and Perfect Recall. I am super excited to talk to Jonathan. Good to see you again. Thank you. I am happy to be here. Always a pleasure to see you too, man. I, I look forward to any time I, I get to chat with you. Uh, what are you up to these days? Well, uh, it's summer, kind of taking some time off, been doing uh, some trade shows. Uh, it's it's that busy, then absolutely nothing. And oh, yeah, raising a baby. She's about six weeks old now. Oh, my so that's gosh. Taking up a lot Congratulations, of my <laughs> man. That is very exciting. A yeah. little. Yeah. So everything baby is mind the reader. same and completely different. Oh, I bet. I bet. Are you getting sleep? It It feels like I'm on the road. When I'm home, because, <laughs> you know, you do the late show, you drive three hours through the night for the 6 a.m. flight out and you sleep on the plane for two hours. And then you. Yeah, it's exactly like being on tour. That's Exhausting. very exciting. What's her name? Adelaide. Adelaide. And is she going to go by Addie? Probably. That's that's what she's been hearing the most right now. Yeah, she, she's named after Alexander Herman's wife. OK, who toured for 25 years after he died in the 1800s. So she's she's got a lot of of uh, living up to do to that name. That's awesome. That's that's a, an amazing legacy for her. So uh, you were performing in a theater show down there in Asheville re recently, correct? Yeah, yeah. I performed at the Wortham Center for Performing Arts, and it was a, a sold out crowd. We had the small venue. There there are two or three stages in in the space. And we booked a small one that sold out. So we went to the next largest one and sold that one out. And they were super happy as was I. So it was a, it was a good introduction to Asheville. And yeah. now I'm kind of looking for a place that would be good for a more regular kind of thing. So yeah. that's the current at home project I've got on my plate. I love it. Allie and I have not really spent a ton of time in Asheville, but we have spent a lot of time in Brevard which isn't too far. Yeah. It's maybe 35 minutes from there. Um, yeah, and it's gorgeous. Oh, it's it's beautiful. We, you know, last time we were down there, um, I was down there on a show and then we just made like a vacation out of it and got a little Airbnb in the mountains 
and hiked and did all this. It, it's just so beautiful down there and, and a neat little downtown area, too. Yeah. And everybody there. Oh, did you see the white squirrels? You can't you can't go there without somebody bringing it up. Yeah. We actually had to drive around a bit to find them this time. Um, they they tend to hang out on campus at, Bre- at Brevard College a lot. So you can find them there. But, um, you know, and I always have my camera and taking pictures of, of anything I can down there. So white squirrels. Uh, so anywho, let's get into the the quiz. We're going to ask you a question. And for this first one, we're playing for a joke. So if you get it right, I have to tell you a joke. And if you get it wrong, you have to tell me a joke. All right. This Deal. week, just this week, an attraction in Georgia was blown up by unknown vandals. Was it A, the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta? B, the Georgia Guidestones in Elberton, or C, the U.S. National Tick Collection at Georgia Southern University? I would hope it was the Tick Collection, because those are those are demons on Earth, for sure. And I feel like I would have heard about a lot more fizz if it were the Coca-Cola uh, look at you thing. With so the fizz. I'm going to go with the Guidestone. You are correct. The Georgia Guidestones in Elberton uh, were blown up. Now, do you know about the Guidestones? Have you have you read about these things? They they were on my crazy internet person radar for <laughs> sure. Of what is this kind of cryptozoology weird yeah. artifact kind of a thing? Really and strange. It, I'd known about them for quite a while, and when when I heard that it was blown up, I was like. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> the crazy built it. Crazy destroyed it. Exactly. Like my my crazy theory is that they destroyed it themselves. Like I, be. I bet it was a prank that grew its own life. And then the guys were like, we we can't be a party to this anymore. This is not We've what we intended. Take care of it. Yeah, uh, it's you know, it's one of those things I've always seen driving through that area on the Roadside America app and. Uh, my friend who my, my friend Mark lives in or used to live in, in Atlanta and he told me about it. Um, and I always meant to get there and never did, never got there. And looks like it's never going to happen now. Yeah. I owe you a joke. Uh, here's the this is an awful joke. But, you know, um, sometimes the Guidestones were called America's Stonehenge, which mm-hmm. I refuse to refer to them as. I will call them a redneck Stonehenge, which is a little little closer than uh you know i think america putting american on something like that just gives it too much credence uh so here is the joke you know what beats stonehenge paper henge stupid just a dumb you, you just told a, me it was going to be bad it's, it was it was just for a, some reason i didn't believe you yeah i took it to a level just unexpected i apologize uh, both to you jonathan and to the listeners let's move on question two we're gonna play for a post of a childhood photo on social media so, you know, maybe you can do that any way you want, but I really, I kind of want you to lose this one just because I want to see that sweet mohawk you used to have. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do have a lot of embarrassing photos of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Did, did you ever dye the mohawk? <laughs> was it a dyed mohawk? I, when I was a freshman in college, I had shiny blue, co- like cobalt blue hair, and I was a skater. Yes. And <laughs> in college, I worked with the maintenance team. So I went to, to college in Berea, Kentucky. So here I am, a blue-haired skater punk working with Kentucky maintenance crew. It was a very strange dynamic, and I would do magic tricks for them to get on their good side. Yeah, otherwise they would have never accepted you. Exactly, exactly. So, so magic has always been my social survival strategy. Love it. Love it. As it is for many magicians. That's why a lot <laughs> yep. of magicians get into magic in the first place. Uh, it's social survival and uh, because we don't want to be known for us. We, we need something else. To be, look, you know, remember me for this thing I do, not for me. Exactly. And here's your question. Elberton, Georgia. This is the former site of the Georgia Guidestones. Was home to which of these people who had a song named after them? Was it A, Reuben Hurricane Carter? B, Casey Jones, or C, Old Dan Tucker? Oh, man. This is a complete shot in the dark because I, I'm not familiar with really any of those names or that space. 
So I'm going to go with B, which is the one that feels vaguely familiar. The other two I have zero connection with. Well, three of these names have songs uh, named after them. Two of them are real people. The one that you chose is the only one that is not a real person. Casey Jones, the railroad song by the Grateful Dead. Uh, the A was Reuben Hurricane Carter, which was the Bob Dylan song about the boxer, uh, wrongly imprisoned. And C was Old Dan Tucker, which is the answer. Old Dan Tucker was a mighty man, washed his face with a frying pan. He combed his hair with a wagon wheel and he died from a toothache in his heel. Uh, so get out the way, Old Dan Tucker. You're too late to get your supper. This was a song I sang when I was a kid. I don't know why I was singing a folk song, a weird folk song when I was a kid, but here's a little bit of that. Tucker is a nice old man. He used to ride our Darby Ram. He sent him whizzing down the hill. If he hadn't got up, we'd delayed our still. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way, old man. Tucker, you're too late. Come to supper. So, yeah, it's just a weird song, and, and apparently old Dan Tucker's grave is located there in elberton yeah i had zero clue and i in honor of of this gentleman's agreement i will definitely post a photo of mohawk jonathan for can't, sure can't wait to see it can't wait to see that so like you know it, when when i visit towns like weird old towns or or just towns that i don't know anything about sometimes i'll look at their wikipedia page and and it'll have a section for like notable people from here and this lets you know how far down on the list I had to go looking for something I had heard of because it was like all politicians from the you know early 19th century and like all these people I, that I didn't or, you know, like a fourth string NFL football player from from whenever I, I had to go to old Dan Tucker because I sang that when I was a kid. So Wow. What a what a weird connection from <laughs> way back when to today of how obscure that is and why in the world you were singing that I. The universe is a weird place, man. Yeah. You know what? I, I actually think I remember now, um, now that we're talking about it. Uh, I used to play the spoons when I was a kid. I learned that in uh, Tennessee, we were at a, a train museum and the, the, some guy at the train museum taught me how to play the spoons. He was playing it. And I was like, I want to know how to do this. And I was in kindergarten. And when I was in kindergarten, there was a, a mountain dulcimer band in my hometown of Urbana, Ohio. Um, and one of the teachers at the school ran this band and she said come in and play the spoons with us and and old dan tucker was one of the songs they played and i learned uh, the, the words to it my my dad makes lap dulcimers no way yeah i love it's it one of one of his hobbies that was uh i always when i was a kid always wanted a hammer dulcimer i was a you know played the drums from the time i could walk and yeah. always wanted a hammer dulcimer and uh never got one but still intrigued i might one day be a hammer dulcimer player Maybe, you know, that would fit in in the, the mountains of Brevard, North Carolina, down there where you are. Yeah, absolutely. My when I was in kindergarten through sixth grade, our neighbor was a professional hammer dulcimer player. That's just a what a what a weird title. Uh, I am a professional hammer dulcimer player. Can yeah. you imagine that? Like everyone you would introduce yourself to, you would have to then explain what that means. To every I wonder person. what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it's why you can't say mentalist. You have to say mind reader, right? Exactly. I I genuinely introduce myself as a business consultant nowadays. Do you? Just yep. And then people as say what kind possible. of business, and you say mentalist, and they say what's that? Yeah. What's that? Mind reader. I teach oh, people how to be right now. It's it's the exact same conversation. <laughs> it's just a prolonged times over. It's prolonged by one question. It's uh. <laughs> I'm a business yep. consultant. What what kind of businesses do you consult? I teach people how to be professional hammer dulcimer players. Um, first of all, what you need is a hammer dulcimer. Let's move on. Okay. Question three. For this question, we are going to play for an IOU for a coveted, the internet says it's true, sticker with the show's logo on it. I have run out and I have not yet reordered more. Uh, here's your question. In this episode, we talked about the list of 10 rules for rebuilding society that were inscribed on the stones. Another stone with a list of 10 rules were the tablets of stone carried up Mount Sinai by Moses in the Bible. How many tablets were there? A, 6, B, 3, or C, 2? I 
I think six would be too many for Moses to bring back down. Three would be a challenge, but doable. But I think it would be two for just logistics sake. Well, uh, like a good atheist, your Bible knowledge is on point. And you are correct, sir. It is two. Um, and uh, you win that one. You're undefeated so far, my friend. No, you got you got two wrong. Yeah, got, so you're, yeah, you're one for three. One. You're one for three because of Casey Jones. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, you know, I, I thought that I'd throw that in here because many people have compared the Georgia Guidestones incorrectly to the Ten Commandments. I should say incorrectly in their importance to society. Um, but honestly, right. if we had the choice between the two and we could throw out the whole uh, eugenics part of the inscriptions, the, the rest of those, the, the things listed on the the guidestones weren't all that awful. Like there was one that was like, be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature. Um, mm-hmm. That's, that's good. Balance right. personal right. rights. The would, under 500,000 yeah. would be a challenge too. You know, that one, yeah, that one is a little rough. And then the guide reproduction wisely, mm, we're getting a little mm-hmm. Nazi ish there with that. Right. One, Cause the so. eugenics is, is a qualitative. And then the 500,000 is a quantitative. Yeah. And they're both difficult. Yeah, and quantitatively, look, if the whole world agreed, fine, whatever. Uh, I don't know what you do. Maybe you just stop reproduction or something. I don't know. But the qualitative thing, now it's like the the problem with that is that it's at the discretion of whoever is in power, you know, and that was the one of the major problems with eugenics is that who's mm-hmm. to say what the valuable type of citizen is. Um, right, that know, like, Rawlsian veil of ignorance is yeah. a useful tool. Yeah. If you don't know what kind of society you're going into, Maybe design it so that you'd be fine going in as anybody. As anyone. That would be a much better way to do it than, mm-hmm. oh, this one person is in power. No, thank you. Right, right. Uh, so let's move on. You're doing very well. Question for the first couple sentences. We're already talking about this. The, they support the concept of eugenics. Which one of these famous people was a eugenics supporter? A, Helen Keller. B. Frederick Douglass or C Buster Douglass? I I don't think I I don't remember who Buster Douglass is. Frederick Douglass was faint, like he was a champ. He was awesome. He was all about liberty and the discovery of knowledge. And bizarrely, I think there's a distant bell that Helen Keller was weirdly into eugenics which uh seems deeply ironic to me but that will be my final answer a it was the irony that made it an interesting question you are correct it's a uh helen keller said quote our puny sentimentalism has caused us to forget that a human life is sacred only when it may be of some use to itself and to the world end quote so weird um now she was someone who of course saw herself as a useful member of society and was very accomplished despite the you know the the challenges that she was born with but like you got to think that she was inspiring other blind and deaf people in the world who probably wouldn't be seen in her eyes as useful to themselves and to the world or useful to the world anyway um so yeah a very strange person to be <laughs> to be a, a eugenicist uh, but Helen Keller. Also, I found this out and it ruined my day. When I was writing this um, this quiz yesterday, I was wearing uh, my Teddy Roosevelt T-shirt that Allie brought back for me from the National Park. And Teddy Roosevelt was indeed in favor of eugenics, which I was super bummed. He's like my favorite president. And he said some stuff that uh, he has several statements that seem to support eugenics. So, yeah, he was a, a wild character on many fronts. Yeah, the dude had a pet badger. In the White House. So, he did not care, man. Yeah, like if you got a pet badger in the White House, why not say that there shouldn't be feeble-minded people reproducing in the world? You're already a crazy SOB. Um, yeah. So, Good yeah. luck, socks. Yeah, it was, it was uh, it, not, not a, a, a happy thing to find out. I, I, I went upstairs and changed my T-shirt. So, <laughs> anywho. <laughs> uh I didn't, uh, you know what I didn't do for question number four is I didn't put any stakes on it. Um, This is the second time I've done this in a row. So for this one, since you got it right, I'll go upstairs and do the dishes when we're done. Nice. There we go. Nice. 
So we've come to the last question, and this one, Jonathan, is for all the marbles. Uh, if you get this wrong, I'm banning you from the show. Never to be asked on again. I will never ask you about uh, Adelaide. I will never ask you about... It's Adelaide, right? It is. Okay. I'll never ask you about what is going on in your life, what's new. It'll just... You'll just... You, you're you dead to me if you get this wrong. It's a simple question. If you could carve a stone to give advice to all humanity, what would it say? Ooh. Oh man. Now remember, my my your first... ability to reappear on this podcast relies on you answering this question. Yeah, my my first instinct would to uh, to be flippant and say nothing is carved in stone. <laughs> but that wouldn't be useful, right? <laughs> Listen, if we're getting our advice from a stone, maybe usefulness isn't ne- something we should necessarily even care about. True. True. I I would say cause and effect is real. Cause and effect is real. The truth of karma. I think mm-hmm. that that's a right answer. I'll give that one to you. Um, when I wrote this question, I tend, I, I was thinking about what I would say, and I didn't really come up with anything good other than like some, some, something about kindness, some words about kindness, because there's so much that can fall under kindness, you know, and, and base, the basic golden rule. Um, but I kind of, think that you know maybe cause and effect is also the golden rule in a way um it's very very much the same thing so uh you got that right i'd be happy to have you on the podcast again sometime next time bring your your daughter she'll be maybe uh i don't know 12 weeks 14 weeks old by that point and she'll be able to you know talk and read minds and all kinds of fun stuff so thank you so much for coming on the show man i appreciate it my pleasure as well it's it's always a delight i'm i'm glad that i didn't shame you myself my family or my forefathers or the greater mentalist business at consultant community well that's all for this week thanks to jonathan pritchard for being my guest here's a kid i've never met thank you for listening to the internet says it's true To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it. See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Zachariah Hickman and Kevin McLeod. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17, USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. 